You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 115, Face Scanning Your Next Denture Patient. This week on The Dental Guys, Brad the Dental Lab Guy joins us to talk about face scanning your next denture patient. I'm sick and tired of hearing about this. Is this really here to stay or do we just need to continue to take regular images? We also discuss what's going on with single unit crowns. Has anything changed? Has zirconia, Emax changed? And then is there really a replacement for zirconia hybrids or bar wrapped in acrylic yet? We're looking for the next full arch component, and Brad is here to tell us all about it this week on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this, I don't know, we usually say weeks episode of The Dental Guys, but we're, we're getting fast and furious here with the releases to because you know we got nothing better to do than talk about dentistry viruses craziness but you know what before we're, this episode is that there are no viruses allowed no. no discussion of any corona viruses the rona is not coming in <laughs> to this you know i saw a great meme the other day you've seen the one with the lady screaming and the cat at the table <laughs> And, and she's screaming and she's like, she's like, it's called COVID-19 and the cat's at the table and he, he, he's, the, the, the meme says, he's got the Rona. So, you know, that's one of my favorites I've seen, but that's the last we're going to mention that. So before we bring our guest in, let's Hmm. talk about something much more important. Let's talk about what is going on in the world of kombucha, Wes, because a few weeks ago, Wes I mean, you guys know, if you've listened to the show for a while, you know Wes is this guy. He's got he's kind of into everything. He's got a little bit of everything going on. And when he gets mm-hmm. in his mind that he needs to figure something out, he does not give it up until he's mastered it. So a few weeks ago, Wes said, I'm making kombucha. And I was kind of like, oh. But where are we with it, Wes? How's it coming? Oh. Where? Tell me, give us, give us all an update. We're all dying to know what the kombucha is going. Let me just say... That we're not talking about viruses here. No. We're talking about a symbiotic culture <laughs> of bacteria and yeast. <laughs> right here I have in my hand a seven-day first fermentation. Oh, you just peed in that cup. Come on. Right? Be honest. A first fermentation of kombucha. Oh, oh he's going right? to drink it. He's going to drink it. Ah! Mm. Mm. Does it go down it's easy? Tangy. Oh, yeah, this is nice. Actually, it's got a little bit. This will be ready to bottle in a few days. So describe to me what that tastes like. And if you're not watching the YouTube, if you want to, if you if, well, if I could describe what it looks like, it looks like urine, looks like straight up mm-hmm. urine, 100% urine, but mm-hmm. it's not. So what what are we tasting, Wes, when you when you drink See that? What are you floaties in there? That's, that's uh, pieces of the mother. That's pieces of the mother. <laughs> so what does it taste right? like? Like, describe it. Well, okay, so kombucha is made out of, of sweet tea, right? Uh-huh. And then it, and basically what it tastes like is it tastes like a little bit of tea, right? Okay. And then it, it's as kombucha ferments, right? The sugar, the sweetness <clears throat> goes away and some vinegar taste comes out, right? Okay. So you're transitioning from something that's sweet tea to more of a vinegar base. Now, this is the first fermentation. And this is, you know, I can get some of that vinegar kind of flavor coming off of this, but there's still some sweetness here. I feel like this needs to go a little bit longer because I don't like it sweet. Okay. So after this is finished, right, and I just poured this out of my tap, I've got a continuous brew process. If you know anything about kombucha, some of you out there are kombucha brewers because I know you've responded to Yeah, we've gotten some messages from these people. We've gotten some messages from people, right? Man, they're serious. Right. So this right here is a completed now oh, this is what you would that. be interested in john rogers right this is right up your alley and in fact if you were here right now i'm trying he's holding to a bottle of a red liquid 
that right. has got some solids settled into the bottom of it, I see, and it's you, uh, capped. It looks like something, like it looks kind of like a uh, homebrewed like soda-ish thing, but then there's some solids floating around in there. So what So what kind is that? Well, John, so if, you, if anybody knows John Rogers like I do, right, I know that John Rogers at the meetings, like you're going to find John <laughs> in the pre-meeting breakfast area uh-huh. around the berry table right uh-huh. so this is the john rogers kombucha right yeah here. i mean this if, is, if you give me the john rogers kombucha. if you tell me that you're making dessert right and, or breakfast pastries or something and it's chocolate i'm i'm gonna pass it up not not i'm not gonna say no to chocolate. i don't hate it but if you no. give me a choice between chocolate ish things or caramel or something like that and berries, I will go for the berries every time. In fact, I have a friend who she always, like whenever we go anywhere, she gets an apple. She buys apples for me because she says it's all I eat. Mm. And I, it's not. But you have made a berry kombucha, and yeah, that is, is right up my alley. The John Rogers kombucha, right? Okay. So this is, so what, what we've done with this kombucha is we've taken blackberries, okay, raspberries, Ooh. and blueberries. Oh, and we've juiced them, right? Triple threat. And then and then what we do is we put a third of the berry uh, juice down <clears> at the <throat> bottom of the of the of the barrel here or the bottom of the bottle. And then you cap that off with what you saw me drinking earlier, which is the first fermentation kombucha and then you cap that off and then it naturally carbonates. Like if you can see this on the screen there, yeah. you can see there's see quite some a bubbles, bit of carbonation bubbles. in this. If you were to uncap this right now, it would probably destroy this studio <laughs> because it's so much pressure. You have to have a cu- cup over top of this. Wow. But this is an excellent drink. John, you would really enjoy this. I can't imagine you not enjoying it, knowing the things that you like to, to taste and things because you are you have a good palate. All right, so I have another one that's not completed yet. Oh, my gosh. And this Look is, at this. He's this got another can- bottle that, again, looks like urine with solids in it. Right. Now, this is a orange strawberry kombucha. I've not tasted orange it yet. Orange strawberry. It's not that done. does sound yeah. good. It does. Yeah, it looks, I, it sounds I, a lot better than it looks. I'm going to be honest. We we really are excited about this one. This will be ready here in a few days. Okay. We'll refrigerate it and try it. But this is an orange strawberry kombucha. And so I've got, I've got a berry and an orange strawberry there. You can kind of see the differences there. Now, if you went to one the is, store, you would pay several dollars. Oh, this is four three or four bucks yeah right so look at three you making your own saving some money yeah. and you know i mean man. during this time we're we're taking a little break i mean these are the kind of things that you, you got nothing but time let's experiment yeast with some bacteria, kombucha man. yeast and bacteria right not viruses <laughs> no viruses no viruses here so right today we've got a really great episode planned for you guys because you know, we've been focusing, you know, we, you've heard us, if you've listened up till now, <clears throat> you've heard us say several times to take advantage of this time that you have where you may be shut down uh, to learn and to better yourself and be ready for when it's time to ramp back up. With that in mind, we've got a special guest who we're going to introduce in just a second after the break and a word from our sponsor who is going to uh, tell us kind of what's new uh, in the in the lab world. So let's take a quick break and uh, listen to our sponsor. We'll be right back. This is Justin Goodbread, and here is today's tip. Hey guys, it's Justin Goodbread here with Financially Simple. The team that you have assembled in your practice to serve your patients is just as vital as any other area of your business. Ultimately, your team can make your practice more valuable than any other practice. You may be the owner of the company, however, your hygienist your receptionist, your billing processor, or whomever you have in the practice is a part of your team. They are helping you work toward a goal. That being said, you want to build a team intentionally. Hundreds of movies have been created about building teams to win championships. And that's exactly what you're after. You're building a team with the championship in mind. If you have any questions about how to increase the value of your practice or how to potentially double your net worth, 
every three to five years? Hey, reach out to us via financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist, and we'd be more than happy to help you. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. And we are back. And I told you you had a good episode. And here we are. We've got Brad, the dental lab guy, back again. Welcome back, Brad. Thanks, John. Wes, good to be back. Thanks for having me. It's been a little while. Yeah, it's been it's a little been a while. while. I think it's been it, too long. Have you, have you too missed long. us, Brad? I missed you guys. I've been a bit busy. Things have been, uh, you know, we, we did an <laughs> addition busy. to the building. Uh, we got a lot of stuff going on. So don't yeah. say the V word. Yeah. Don't say the V word. Yeah. We're just going to say, yeah, that's all it's been. It's been, you've been busy with been the busy. addition at the lab. Yeah. You've been, but, and tell us just real quick, how much space are you adding? Like a ton? Uh, we added 7,000 square feet onto Only the building. Seven. What? Only so. seven. Well, it's oh 100% for implants, you know, so we have uh, expanded our uh, inventory for the implant, the Argon implants, uh, the implant solution surgical guide business is in there, and all manufacturing of, you know, custom abutments and <clears throat> bars and, cool. uh, you know, the, the manufacturing restorative part of implants is all in that. Uh, did another con hmm. a conference room, a larger ba break room, uh, learning center, so yeah. Man, a lot in. That's awesome. Yeah, it's been good. And so when is and is that complete now? Yeah, we moved in in November. Yep. Mm. So it's complete. Nice. Yeah. Nice. That's exciting. So, I can't wait to see it. I think um, my I plan is as as soon as we can get back to rolling normalcy here, um, I'm I know if all things work out, I'm going to send one of my new employees right up there. I'll remain unnamed, but uh, <laughs> but you know who I'm talking about, right? Brad and John knows who I'm talking oh, about. Yeah. And if you're listening to this right now, you probably know who you're talking about. Um, but I think they're excited about coming up there. In fact, that was one of the main things that that I kind of put in as like I wanted to do and is to get them up because we know how important it is to, you know, understand as dentists a little bit about the lab and maybe more sometimes than you think you should understand, we should understand. And that's why we got Brad the Dental Lab guy on today is to talk a little bit about what's going on, what's the heartbeat of the lab industry. We're going to kind of talk a little bit about where we're at with some of the materials, some of the new technology. And John, why don't you lead in with some of those questions? Yeah, well, we were just, you know, uh, th there's this extravaganza, you know, really that happens in Chicago uh, every year where we've got like, I think it's eight it's total crazy. dental meetings it's happening crazy. within one weekend. You know, there's there's the the actual Chicago midwinter, which is kind of like the, the mothership meeting with a lot of general dentists. Then you got, <clears throat> you know, the uh, Equilibration Society. They cause, <laughs> there's, a, there's a cosmetic dentistry one going on. There's the American Academy of Fixed Prosthodontics where, where, where we were uh, covering uh, some of those uh, speakers and topics there with uh, quintessence. And then there's Lab Day. And Lab Day is... I mean, Brad, is it the biggest lab meeting in the country? You know, I believe so. I, I can't be quoted on that, but I'm pretty sure it's the largest conglomerate of lab technicians that come yeah. together. And it's one of those that you go to pretty much every year. Is yeah, that right? I have gone to this for, I couldn't even tell you how many years since I've been in the dental business. Um, we've always went down to Chicago midwinter and, and taken part and, and, just like you guys, there's different meetings that happen within our meetings too. Like I belong to a group called the Cal Lab, uh, which is you know a membership uh, where all labs get together and we kind of have speakers brought to us and talk about different subjects. We have a closed forum. Uh, no manufacturers are in there, so we can kind of share you know how people are doing things. Is this working? Isn't that working? Um, so we have that meeting early on in the week, and then we kind of go to the lab day in at the Hyatt, which you know has trade shows and other breakout meetings that happen. Mm. Yeah. And we were hearing as we were at the AFP meeting, we had some of the speakers, you know, the speakers, some of them are speaking at like three or four different meetings, giving kind of a variation of the same talk because there's new products that are being unveiled. There's new techniques, there's new technologies. Um, and they're kind of trying to translate that to the lab on one hand and also to the clinician. On the other hand, we saw that at AFP. We had a couple of the speakers who had been over at Lab Day uh, earlier in the day, 
and then they had you know a slightly different presentation that they were giving to the clinicians because you know technology as you well know Brad it's it used to be all driven kind of by well at least a lot of it by kind of the dentistry side you know people would come up with the technology at a dental school or a dentist would come up with something and that would then become an industry they would maybe invent something now the industry largely the lab industry and mainly the the product manufacturers are driving a lot of actually our clinical decision making you know they're they're saying hey we have this new process that we're new product we've developed and so we have to have communication between the clinical side the lab side so we were we were getting hit with a lot it's funny you were texting us and you had just texted us about something we're going to talk about in a minute with facial recognition or with uh, facial scanning and literally the just 10 minutes later this the the speaker i think it was the same speaker uh was giving the talk on it at our meeting um, so it really is cool because you're getting essentially, you really feel like you're living on the, the edge a little bit of like what's really new and going on. So let's maybe start the conversation there. We, you, you know, facial scanning and facial recognition, you know, trying to create a virtual patient. Yeah, but we try to do this, on, like, John, we've tried we, to do this, like since the right. beginning They've of They've been time. talking about it for years. But I'm tired, I'm sick and tired of hearing about it, right? I'm, I'm sick and tired I'm of being sick and tired of this. <laughs> I am because here's the thing, like, man, we talked about this stuff, like Xbox like Connect. Like years ago. Right, Xbox Connect, come and set it up in my office. It takes 45 minutes to set up all these cameras and stuff. And then Brad and I were like, no, we're not doing that. You know, we just, we, I mean, we can't even use it in software. It's not, a, it's a concept, right? Is this yeah. really ready for prime time, Brad? Because you and I have been taking pictures, 2D images, and doing right. amazing dentistry together with just some just regular pictures. But is really 3D scanning? Come on. I mean, I'm skeptical. I'll just be honest. Yeah, with where you. are we at with this, yeah. Brad? I think we're all skeptical because we all watch that cycle happen. We all want it to be there because we want to have the patient three dimensionally in the laboratory because that's what we miss. I, you know, I don't see lip lines, I don't see eyes, I don't see nose, I don't see you know the shape of the face. So we want it. We want it bad. I think more than the dental lab business than than anybody's. Um, in the past, like you said, facial recognition was costly. I think that was the biggest barrier. Did it work? Yeah, it was there, but it was cost prohibitive. Um, mm -hmm. This is a product I have high hopes for. Uh, Bellis is the product, and mm -hmm. they are claiming that you can take an iPhone. It has to be an iPhone only because they have the three cameras on the iPhone. Um, and you download the app, and you literally just scan, you know, three-dimensionally. You scan the head, and you're able to import that into the three shape software. Um, why I think this one is going to be the real deal is not only, you know, the companies out there, but they're working with three shape. Uh, and I still classify three shape as one of the number one dental lab softwares. They're integrating with three shape. So mm -hmm. that's part of the problem is it's okay to have this third party that's out there, but if you can't integrate it seamlessly into the CAD software that the dental laboratories are using, it's a problem. And they right. are. So Bellis and 3Shape are working hand in hand to be able to import this file. And now we're able to do you know, three-dimensional designing of the teeth within the three-dimensional uh, space of the face. Okay, so... so software wise you just made some kind of pretty awesome statements there you feel like the leaders in this is the three shape design software you're using but we still have this multiple software <coughs> in and out type thing one of the things that recently happened if you haven't been paying attention is that exocad was recently bought by Align Technologies are acquired, and that's one of the softwares you're using as well, Brad. Uh oh. Uh, does uh -oh. that affect? Wait a second. Let's pause. Wait. What? Let's pause. Just a moment. <laughs> Let's just rewind. Just drop that bomb there, and just uh... you just dropped the bomb, <laughs> and then you tried to go on and ignore the crater that you just left. Yeah. So, Exocad was purchased by Align Technologies. Okay, since you went there, Wes, Brad. <laughs> are you worried? Because I'm very worried. What do you think is going to happen? Um, I'm worried because we <laughs> Exocad, in my mind, is one of the most uh, creative softwares. It's not the biggest in the in the dental industry, mm. but it is mm. a fantastic, fantastic software. And um, it, I'll call it a niche software. Uh, 
I'm, I'm, I'm a little worried, John. I'll be honest with you. I'm not sure because when we watched Itero get bought up by a line, uh, their focus in restorative wasn't there. It was towards the aligners, right? Because, of course, Align Specialties mm-hmm. is making aligners. So more in the ortho, and they really hedged it more towards the ortho and producing and promoting Itero towards that. Didn't mean they didn't do restorative. I just think their emphasis was on aligners. I'm anxious to see what their emphasis is going to be with ExoCAD. So stay tuned. I guess well, we'll I'll just all see. Well, I'll just say this. I mean, like, their tagline on their website is still, your freedom is our passion. And I'll just say this about Align Technologies. It took them, like, forever to even give us the ability as dentists, the dentist, <clears throat> to be able I mean, to rotate they a are, freaking tooth, man. They are, it's, I mean, between them and Serona, it's a battle for who is the most restrictive mm-hmm. to the dental world. Right. I mean, they, Serona's definitely winning. I mean, they I think they've established <laughs> we are the most restrictive. But if you look at a line, I mean, for two, what has it been, three years, they have, they have basically uh, systematically tried to take three shape out Correct. of their world. Because you can't even, I mean, how ridiculous is it that I can't send a trio scan to a line to have them manufacture well, I think that's aligners. why this is interesting, John, is because um, ExoCAD is amazing, and now we have 3Shape, and it's amazing, and let's the best man win, that's what's right? Is that happen. what's going to happen? And let's hope they keep it more open than closed in the process. Yeah, because I feel like the way that these best man win situations happen is a line puts up the finger to 3Shape, <laughs> And says, yeah, like we don't, we're not letting you send scans, so let's see what you can do. And then 3Shape approaches another company and says, well, okay, we're going we're gonna to go to ClearCorrect. And we're going to try to create the most streamlined workflow we can with them. And we're going to try to, you know, so one company becomes the company of openness. That's kind of their whole sh- the shtick, really. And the other company becomes... The, the, the idea of, hey, it's curated, it's controlled, everything works with each other. So, you know, if we, if we validate this workflow, you know it's going to work. But when you're, and when you're the clinician, you just have to decide which one you want to go with. But when you're in the lab world, I mean, any type of closing off of a system seems like it negatively affects you guys. Absolutely. The, you know, the more open we can stay, the better off everybody is. I like that versatility. So I'm not an advocate for the closed systems by any means. So, you know, let's hope that a line um, keeps things open. They, they got a great software. They purchased a, a fantastic <laughs> company. Um, it's just to wait and see what they're going to do with it. Let's hope they do the right thing. Yeah. Well, let's hope that that, that gets... We go the right direction. So back to Let's hope that that's back to this facial scanning. You feel like this is a promising thing. I I hope it's a promising thing. I really do. When I see mm-hmm. them starting to work with companies and in integration, because that's the biggest problem that we have in the lab business. Again, somewhat you know, we'll call it openness. You know, we have ERP systems. We have facial recognition scanning now. We have the CAD softwares. Uh, you know, we got comb beam uh, surgical planning. You know, we need to see more integration of all those softwares coming together versus all standalone. What excited me about Bellis is they're automatically working with 3Shape. They're trying mm-hmm. to make it in as an easy import into 3Shape. I also saw 3Shape working with ERP systems. So we happen what, to use... What's lab- ERP? Like, you uh, it's a, for it's a, basically a system that runs our laboratory scheduling, workflow processing in the laboratory. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, for us, it's data input. So every time I get a, a scan, whether it's a Itero or a three shape or a whatever type of a scan, that's one digital input coming in. And then I have to input that information into my ERP or my manufacturing software. So it's more data input. We're seeing three shape also now starting to work with those softwares. So we don't have to do dual input. Um, so when it comes in, it goes directly into a product we use is called LabTrack. And that is one of the first softwares that 3Shape's working with is integration. So back to the, three sh- the three-dimensional the three scanning, that's what excites <laughs> me as they're working with those lab softwares to get you know automatic integration into that, uh, which means I think they're here to stay. Um, you, you know, 
the iPhone, when I talked to them, they basically said, you know, it works and it's a good product. Uh, but what's better is they do actually have a sit down camera system that you can purchase that is a little bit more streamlined. Don't quote me on the price. I think it was around that ten to fifteen thousand or something like that. Uh, oh no, I, I take that back. Uh, I think it was around the five thousand uh, for the for the sit down camera. And again, don't quote me. Um, so they have two different options to be able to do scan faces. So tell me what you're gonna do with it because I look at a two dimensional photo with a wax rim or an aesthetic try in, right? and I can show you lip at rest, and I can show you full smile, and I can show you a side view to look at profile, okay? And I understand that you can do all of that with a three-dimensional scan, but it's a still a static image, right? So you still can only, you're taking a 3D scan of one position, you know? So, so what, what are you gonna do with that that you're not gonna be able to do with photos at this point? Well, it allows me, it is, it is not a static two-dimensional image. It is a three-dimensional. It's kind of like a comb beam. Um, you right. know, so it, I'm able to input the full face into my CAD software. So as I'm designing the teeth, I have the lips right there and I can do side profiling. I see where the lips at rest are. I can see high smile. Um, so when I'm designing my teeth, I'm designing it within the face instead of just in space. So this and helps with face so bows, right? So, so I mean, you, like, so this you is like the have, ultimate you're, face And you're saying you could have multiple shots, like a high smile and a lip at rest, and all of those could be overlaid to where you could click them on and off and see that in the same patient? I'm not going to speak as a professional. I only saw one or two, uh, basically, speakers that talked about this. I have yet to download it. That is one thing that I did try to download it on an iPhone and I had some problems. So, you know, I, I still think there, you know, maybe it was just me. Um, you know, of course, you know, I haven't had a lot of time to go and throw it in our software as I'm waiting for three shape to have full integration before I go mainstream on it. But what I understood is that you, you know, you're able to input different three dimension, uh, cause it's a, basically it's a file, right? So we can input different files, uh, meaning, different lip positions into three shape okay well well okay it could be cool i could mean if, cool. if if you could overlay it's still you know, like me, a lip at rest time. and a high smile and you could change your tooth position library and kind of see what that's going to look like i mean that i could see being useful right. i mean i, I uh, it'd be interesting it'd be interesting to see i still feel like what we need is we need it like a dynamic be able to be you know have a moving right uh, you know, cause you know, if you push a tooth out facially, you still don't exactly know well, how what that that's affects doing the lip, you, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. So I'm, mean, but, but I think it's, a, I mean, Matt Roberts spoke at AFP. He was the one that spoke on it and showed, you know, what it could potentially do. Uh, Lyndon Cooper got up and showed like a quick little, you know, facial scan. And I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely cool. It's whiz bang, you know, but I, I hope it ends up being, you know, the next thing. It would be neat. Well, it's, I, think I think it's time to move on to something like some material stuff, right? Because, Ooh. you know, I think we've kind of, you know, <clears throat> standardized some, certain things for some time uh, or, um, as far as like crowns, right? We've got full contour zirconia. We've got some high translucency zirconia. And we've got some lithium disilicate, and I know the manufacturing processes are, you know, changing a little bit regarding those. Um, is there any updates on those materials? You know, the biggest thing I saw in the transition when it comes to zirconia uh, specifically was everybody and their brother has one. And, hmm. uh, you know, I saw a, a ton of infiltration into the market, more so than I've seen in the past with um, offshore zirconias, um, hmm. you know, different countries manufacturing zirconias and trying to get more in the U.S. market. Of course, all of those are cost driven. Almost every one of those led me a flyer with a, we're a $59, you know, a $69 or a $99, hmm. you know, something super, super cheap and inexpensive. Um, so that's their, their driving motivation is cost. I never once heard yep. quality. Yep. It was always cost. Right. Um, so I saw that as a big change. Uh, lithium disilicate is still very popular in the market. You know, we all know that by Emacs generally controls the market. Um, 
you know, that's still the number one on the market. Uh, there's Vita has, has entered the market with some millable blocks um, that is supposed to somewhat compete with that. But I haven't seen that really hit uh, mainstream real heavy yet. I still think Ivo Clear does a pretty good job with that market share. So not a ton of developments there. The one thing I will tell you that every time a zirconia comes out uh, that I am aware of and they offer a free puck, I always mill a sample crown. I have the STL file. It's the same exact crown I mill out every single time. And I always get an A2. And I think there I have like 20 different samples right now of, a, of A2 zirconia from that company. We don't do any staining and glazing. We just mill it in the color and, and just polish it. And it is amazing you know, I have 20 samples, all 20 are a different A2. There's no standardized A2. Um, so that's one wow. thing I have not seen is any consistency <laughs> among the products that are on the market. You know, I can't hold an A2 shade tab up to any of them and say, that's a perfect match. Does it matter, Brad, mm -hmm. like what kind of zirconia you're using for single unit crowns? You know, I'd say let's wait and see because I don't know what these these offshore zirconias do. You know, do they mill them? And I could could I do it if I wanted to and cut my inventory cost? I could, but I don't know what's in them. You know, mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm dealing with you know either Germany uh, manufactured somebody who's got a reputation, been in the industry for a long time. Um, it's just my belief. It's not say the other stuff doesn't work. I just don't want to take the chance. Not with my business. Yeah, yeah, and, and do you think there's a trend? more toward the higher translucency zirconias, uh, more cubic, uh, more of these Y5 uh, type of zirconias. And are you worried about that? Uh, do you think it's a competitor to Emacs or to lithium basilicate at this point? Because uh, I know we're, what, a couple years out now mm -hmm. with those materials. That was another one where the industry basically created this, you know, and then now people are like, well, I don't really know, but it looks pretty good. But what do you, what do you think? And, and what's the, where is the industry moving more that way? Or is it still kind of, uh, you know, toward the higher, potentially higher strength? It's still, it's moving towards that way, John, you know, again, the, the Wi fives they're more translucent. So they're weaker, you know, seven to 800 megapascal recommended only up to a three unit bridge. Um, so nothing to exceed that. Uh, again, though, the problem I'm having is every manufacturer has inconsistencies. Their translucencies are different percentages. The colors are different. Um, mm -hmm. So unfortunately, you're still relying on some stain and glaze overlay to be able to hit the shade. Um, and anytime you add some type of uh, color to the exterior of the crown, it does kind of dilute that translucency a little bit to hit the shade. Um, I, we've had pretty good luck with them. Uh, it, you know, obviously you have to know what type of prep you're working over top of, if it's a dark stump or if it's a metal post and core that works to a disadvantage because that translutes through. We've talked about that in the past, but I see the market shifting more and more that way. Again, multi-colored, so it has a shaded effect. It's not monochromatic. It's not all one color. Most companies mm -hmm. are starting to come out with that, you know, darker, uh, it's a gingival, a little lighter in the mid body and an incisal, more of an incisal type lighter shade. Um, so I'm seeing definitely a, a trend that way. Well, m most of what we've talked about, and that's interesting to hear that, um, you know, what's happening in kind of the single unit world, you know, with materials. Um, let's kind of shift gears over to full arch stuff and talk about uh, first maybe some fixed full arch materials and what we're seeing there. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about the removable world. Um, do you, has anything you've seen or anything you saw this year changed your view on what you would use for say full arch fixed implant restorations, uh, based on, based on what your, what materials we have now, Brian? You know, that's one thing I've been holding back on a little bit. There's a, a you know, quite a few different substructure, uh, materials that are out on the market where, you know, either it's a fibrous type substructure material, and then you put composite over top of it. Um, and then put individual crowns or bridges looted over top of that. We've been reserved holding back because I got mixed feelings whether what's long term, you know, what's long term on the product? Is it going to fracture? Is it going to break? So we've been a little bit more reserved on our side. Um, I have been just now experimenting with a new product or newer, it's a peak uh, called Juvora. And, you know, I got one case, to be honest, uh, that was for a doctor for his brother in law. 
uh, that we're just going to kind of let it sit. And we actually did um, composite crowns uh, over top of the substructure. What I like about Peak is it's not as hazardous for my technicians to handle. If you look at the SDS sheets on this material, um, it's you know it's just a Peak, so it's easier to grind on. Um, and handle and you also don't have to cover it so the integral surface you can leave with peak exposed you can just polish it some of these materials that are fibrous materials you have to 100 percent cover them um, so plaque doesn't get attached to them because it's in essence uh, i guess i compare it to like a fiberglass type material um, also if you look at the sds sheets it's fairly hazardous to inhale Man, that's something you don't even um, think about right because you know, no, we're no. sitting here like talking about mask and stuff like hazardous inhale inhalation of materials as you're sitting there grinding and polishing on this right you have hmm. to think about that from a standpoint of your osha right i mean like yeah. that could right. be bad it could be bad you know and my i have uh basically a process improvement production manager and he manages our safety also. And he was the first one who caught it when I brought the material in. He, of course, thing he, first thing he does is grab the SDS sheets, pulls me aside and he says, Brad, I just, I got to advise you here this stuff. We'd have to put special protocol in the laboratory for me to feel comfortable. What material, can to, you say what to, material to that was? Material. I, I'd rather not say it. I don't know if it's like, I want to name it out loud, um, but it was a fibrous substructure right. material. Hmm. You know, and I, you know, I don't know this on all of them, but I have a feeling that most of them that have fibers in them, I haven't read all their SDS sheets, but my guess would be that they're all probably the same way. Because if you look at fiberglass, That's right, fiberglass stuff, is man. the same thing in fiberglass shops. Interesting. You know? So you have to think about more than just the properties in terms of uh, strength and stuff. You got to think about, you know, how are we going to deal with this product in the lab? Mm. Um, so, so it sounds like essentially you're kind of still where you're at. You're looking to see, you know, if based on long term what we're going to see with some of these newer materials. What about what about removable, though? Because that's been an area that's been, once again, kind of like we talked about earlier in the podcast, we've been talking about it for a long time. I'm sick and time tired, John. I'm sick and tired. Sick and tired. Right. We've been talking sick. about this this whole digital denture thing, you know, for like forever. Right. It seems like it's like, what in the world? Like, can we scan soft tissue? Yeah, we can scan it. But I mean, we still have to have an impression, right? We, <clears throat> right. I mean, some people are out there saying, "No, you don't. No, you can, you can scan, you can border mold and scan." And I'm like, you know, right. everybody's got their own little favorite like hack and workflow. But like, we're talking about like repeatable dentistry, predictable mm -hmm. stuff. And that, I mean, I was talking to your brother the other day, who's co-owner of Dental Crafters, right, Bob, and and he, brother Bob, he really he was really not keen on some of the new stuff, right? I mean, he was a little hesitant, like you said, to jump in there. Speak to that a little bit. You know, we've been, like you said, taking a part of all the different webinars and seminars about, you know, removable and the new products that are out. The problem we've been running into on the printing side, because we really want printing to work mm. for denture base. Um, and we've had problems with aesthetics. They look they just don't mm. look good. They don't look natural. They don't look as good as a process dentist uh, denture that we've done for umpteen years. Um, also, we've noticed them to be a little bit on mm. the brittle side. Um, so you drop them and they fracture a little bit easier. So they're not as resilient as some of the other products that we've done again in the past. Um, for those of you who don't understand what we're doing is we're printing a denture base and then you end up printing denture teeth um, and looting them into the dentures. So basically all the teeth are connected. Uh, there's several different methods out there. There's some denture teeth that they're saying are, it's like an STL file that the, you, you can order CAD cam denture teeth that have kind of a preformed bottom and, you know, can lude those into Dent them. Supply um, just recently released a whole product surrounding even a partnership with uh, Carbon. Lucitone, Lucitone 199. 199. Uh, Dent Supply visited your lab uh, to talk to you guys about it. What's your initial thoughts? They did. Uh, they, you know, asked us if we wanted to be an early adopter into it. We seriously I love this. Wait, stop right there because that to me is a crater, ever. John. That's a massive bomb, <laughs> right? And you just stopped me earlier. Like, <laughs> they want us to be an early adopt, or early adopter of this, and we're seeing this advertised. As if it's like in the market, it's ready to go, it's ready for prime right. time. We've been doing this for years. And you just heard it. We yeah. need early adopters. 
Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been a substantial investment for us to, you know, buy in basically to be, a, you know, one of the earlier laboratories to, to print. Um, we were close. Uh, you know, Lucifilm 199 in the past has been a wonderful product and that's why has always had a good acrylic. But this is different. You know, you're printing it again off of carbons. Um, we ended up luckily, uh, my brother Bob was over in Italy and we found a product in Italy that I think is going to be a fit for us. It kind of merges um, old technology and new technology together. So it's kind of slash half analog, Wes, because as you said, you still mm -hmm. need to have a impression to have a good denture fit yet. You can't really predictably scan it, but we're able to merge um, some digital into manufacturing a denture and it looks hey, more Hey, wait, realistic. I'm gonna stop you right there. Um, because yeah. the dental guys have um, been working on some stuff with you guys, right? Trialing this stuff out. I had some denture bases sent to me that had yep. some special dots on them, right? So yeah. that's this new process, yeah. right? It is, and it's early uh, adopter. You and I've worked with some of this product. <laughs> it's right, early adopter. Uh, but this uh, this product that we're working with, um, it also is taking two dimensional pictures of the patient with an aesthetic control base in the patient's mouth with dots that are on it, like mm. physical black dots uh, to help recognize. Mm -hmm. Still has the glasses. Yeah, you still take the pictures with the glasses. Then you import that, and again, that's part of. We have some facial imaging within the design uh we have some special denture teeth that we've purchased where we can still um you know digitally do a setup and then we print basically a matrix where the teeth go into it and then we process the base you know to that so it's it's still digital analog but what i like about it is the acrylic part of it looks it looks good. It looks like what we're used to. Um, it, we didn't go backwards in aesthetics. If anything, we went digital, but we didn't. Uh, I'll say this about the clinical the side of things. things. If you know how to make a denture, you're going to know how to do this. If you know how to take a picture, you know how to do Correct. this. You don't right. have to buy anything. Which that's, <clears throat> that's huge. Easy use is one of the major, um, you know, the major issues we've seen with some of these systems where, you know, it's like putting together a, you know, putting together like a Tinker Toy set of stuff in the patient's mouth to try to, you know, do these digital jaw relation records and, and we're, we're finding easier ways to do it. So that answers one of my questions. Does it look good? Because that's been an issue that we've seen with some of the bases and with the teeth they that they just don't look good. Um, the second question is, um, how easy is it? And my third question is, which you've kind of answered, it's getting easier. What about, durability. Mm. I want to know what your thoughts are on durability of these materials. Um, and, and then I also want to know your thoughts on the actual financial feasibility in the lab. At what point does it actually make sense to implement this in a lab for the time that you spend on these? So talk about durability maybe briefly a little bit and then talk about that, that you know, when, how do you implement this into the lab cost effectively? You know, the durability, it should be as good or better than what we're producing because the acrylic base is basically what we've been doing. It's the denture teeth that changed and how we digitally designed the smile. Um, so we're really still bonding, you know, denture teeth into conventional acrylic that we've, you know, done for years. So I, we didn't go backwards in durability by any means. It's just trying to streamline and getting de the dentures more digitized into the digital world. Um, it, it's a little bit simpler for us because we can design the aesthetic side of things and it makes it a little bit easier for us to have the two-dimensional photo to build that in against because we have the face of the person in front of us. So what I'm hoping for is a more <coughs> predictable, less remakes, less reset type scenario. Um, it does take us a little bit more time from the doctor side of getting the photos because now mm -hmm. I have to take the photos and I got to put them into the software. Um, but all in all, we're anticipating a little bit more streamlined in the laboratory. I don't think we're increasing labor. I think we're decreasing a little bit of labor. It's not significant the way we're doing this. The right way would be, wouldn't it be cool if we just had a printer that printed the denture base and then it flipped into white teeth and it printed it all in one? You know, I mean, that would it would be a huge impact uh, on our labor force. It would be you know, a lot less intensive in labor, but we're not yeah. there yet. But if so, the workflow um, of actually taking 
the photos and you know and setting up the case is you know streamlined which is what you're saying it's it's kind of there um, then it seems like it's just a matter of time before the equipment gets better to where maybe you can you can streamline the process because it seems to me like rather than bonding teeth in if you could have it more of a monoblock it starts to become closer Correct. to what we get with milling versus what we get right. with printing and that's something that we still just haven't quite gotten to where we can make these you know monoblock type of restorations because you're always using two slightly dissimilar materials and and it seems like that's the next level it's the next level you know this is a stepping stone towards that we're getting there uh but we're not quite there yet with almost any of the operations that are out there most of them have a two-part you know you have a denture base and then you're gonna have a white tooth color that you end up bonding the two together well, um, but, you know, I think, you know, well, it's a step. one We're final question as we kind of close out this update um, from Lab Day is, is there one thing that you are super excited about that you're going to be able to implement this year? You know, the one thing that we've been working on uh, is telescopic uh, restorations. So um, telescopic you know, making that, and it's not new. It's been in Germany for a long time. And the United States, it's very, it's, you know, it's, we all know the problems with telescopic. We've talked about them in the past, you know, vertical space, you know, um, some limitations, but uh, we're working on a process internally to do more telescopic um, type abutments, implant abutments, you know, four or six and doing a milled uh, coping or uh, that you know is basically zero, one, or two degree taper, and we process the metal copings into the denture. So it'll be that fixed removable, and looking at doing that for all implant type restorations. Um, we're working on that. That probably excites me more than anything. It's you know, we, it's been there, and but it's not mainstream either. Either we're doing something that's a locator type or a bar over denture, or we're doing a mm -hmm. fixed. Uh, screwing it in, leaving it in. Um, so hopefully we can find that happy medium. So we're pretty excited. Bought and invested in some new equipment, some new technology to help that's us exciting. do such a thing. So I think that'll be coming here. So Kona's concept months. is something uh, that concept. we've very much been interested in. I'm interested mm -hmm. in it too from a standpoint of posterior three and four unit bridges um, where we have all fangled implants and you don't want screw access holes and composite and all that. But we basically, you know, I'm, is that possible right now? I mean, we've seen that from Dent Supply with some of their basic stock stuff uh, called Accurus. You're talking about, you're talking about the Kona metric. Yeah, concept, same though. kind of like thing, we right? Actually, we actually tap it on. You tap it on. But, but I think Brad's talking about where you can slide it off. Well, that's what I'm saying is that. Yeah, yeah, you can take that off, zero, one degree or two, but the accuracy concept, uh, it kind of intrigues me a little bit because now, you know, I have more flexibility um, as far as like seating restorations without cement, those type of things. Have you seen anything on that? You know, not on a three unit bridge scenario, um, not a lot. Most of it is either a partial scenario, you know, where you have some natural teeth and then some teeth that you crown and you put telescopic mm -hmm. crowns on or in the implant world where it's a four or six and you do uh, the abutments at a zero, one or two degree taper. Uh, but not a lot on the three-unit bridges side west. Not to say it won't be coming or we couldn't do it. Um, but I, I work with a couple of labs over in Germany, uh, Boising Dental and mm -hmm. Implant Tech are two friends of ours in Germany. They do a ton of telescopic stuff over there. And uh, then, you know, tapping into their uh, their knowledge a lot more on what they're using. Some of it is uh, the precision of the milling equipment that we have. Uh, so reinvested in some new equipment, uh, milling equipment because if you're doing a one degree taper, it's it's not the abutment of the one degree taper, it's the secondary casting or secondary milled coping that has to fit over mm -hmm. top of that uh, precisely. And then how do you scan that? So once you manufacture an abutment at a one degree taper, how do you rescan that uh, to, to remake another secondary coping? So you know that's what we've reinvested in, some scanning technology and milling technology to Man. give us what we're talking about. That's that what I'm exciting. more excited about. At the lab, the lab day, I didn't see a ton of 
stuff that I got. The ballast is probably the most exciting. You know, the peak materials are, you know, they're, they've they been out there and we've been talking about it, but uh, they, they don't really jazz me up as much as getting more into removable fixed type well, scenarios. This has been good. I'm excited about uh, yeah. what's to come. Um, more things, more things to learn about. Um, and uh, Brad, I really appreciate you coming on the show and uh, sharing a little bit about what's up in the lab industry and what you've been hearing. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. I uh, really appreciate yeah, it's it. Awesome. It's been it's awesome. It's been awesome. And if you've been listening to this and uh, you want to find out more about Brad, of course, uh, you know, he's wearing the shirt right now. It says the Dental Crafters Network, longtime <laughs> sponsor of Dental Guys. And uh, if you want to learn more about kombucha, uh, you know, <laughs> just, I don't know, send Wes a private message and you guys can geek out about that. Uh, I don't know. One of these days, I'll try it. I think. Well, when when the uh, quarantine gets lifted, that'll be my first uh, first thing I'll I'll have to try. Uh, if if you're listening uh, to the show today and you uh, like what we're talking about, you have some comments for us. You want to connect with us? Uh, join us on the socials. Uh, that's Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, the YouTube. Mm. Uh, and of course, if you're listening on any podcast app or on YouTube that allows you to give us feedback. We want your five star reviews on Apple Podcasts. It's one of the ways that shame we connect on you if you haven't done that. New pe- yeah, shame on you if you're sick and tired of you not leaving five star reviews. <laughs> so go ahead and, and and if you like what we're trying to do, this is how we get out to new people. Besides, of course, word of mouth. Tell your friends. Tell your neighbors. Uh, you know, of course, keep a safe social distance as you do it. Uh, but make sure you tell them what uh, we're trying to do and spread the word about the quality we're trying to bring. We'll continue to bring you good quality content as always. And uh, so for Brad, for Wes, I'm John, and we are the Dental Guys.